All right, so welcome back. And uh, today's session, the third and final session, is about surviving dementia in your life. Okay? And I uh, have some credibility in this, in, in, in this area because I survived two dementias, my parents, both of them, dad and mom. So, um, so I'm going to talk today about things you need to take into consideration. I have a quick question. Yes. It's somebody else's dementia, not your own. Surviving Her. somebody else. Uh, yes, but all, but, 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 the, I will be giving you some tips for how to, sur how to survive your own because Jim already knows that I've, I've pointed him towards some resources that may be helpful. So, dementia is a uniquely cruel disease, as some of you already know. It terrifies the, the person who's afflicted, especially in the beginning. When you first start realizing that you are losing your ability to think the way you always did, it's very, very scary. Yes. Right. Um, I know my mom was just, she was so afraid of that happening to her, and so of course it happened to her. And in the beginning, you know, she would just, she, the, the, she, you know, she, she, she knew that a lot of what was going on in her experience was her, came from her. She had a, she, she had a, 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 a psychotic break in December 2010, which was, such vivid hallucinations, and she was able to report everything that she saw the next day. She remembered. She remembered everything in in vivid detail, and she just was able to describe it to me. And after the first day, she was she, she you know she was very clear about it, and then at each successive day, she still retained the memories. But she would, she would say to me, you know, I know that wasn't real. I know that didn't happen. It, it, it came from here. She knew. So, and, and, but it, it's, it evolves over time. And as my mother got, became more demented, she really got into it. And she came up with some, some very interesting ways of interpreting the world that made her world a little more delightful for her at one point. There was a point in between there where she was violent and where she was angry and she was anxious and she was paranoid and she was extremely difficult to deal with. But when she got over that, that hump and she was like just creating a different experience, she was happy. She was flying to Paris. She was riding horses on the beach in Miami she told me twice in the same afternoon that she had been in a beauty contest and won. I loved it. I was so happy for her. She got a PhD. I, my mother didn't graduate high school. So th that she was this creative to me was just, a, and it made me feel good because her, the, the, her, her experiences, though created by her own mind, were very pleasant. Did that last? It lasted for a while. Uh, and, and another interesting thing was that she would create characters to explain the people who were around her because she, she, kept, she would go from environment to environment, right? She would be in assisted, and then she was in the hospital, and then she was in rehab, and then she was in the psychiatric hospital, and then she was back in rehab, and then she was in a new facility. Every time she went someplace new, she came up with characters to explain the people who were around her, and she would point to them and tell me who they were. And they, you know she knew their, she she knew the names that she made up for them. Yes. Just a, a side story. I was in a coma and I had hallucinations. I was ten years old. I had encephalitis. Uh huh. And I still today have a memory of the hallucination. Huh. It was there was a tree outside my window, and to me there were soldiers marching. Wow. The leaves with soldiers marched. Oh, wow. I got a book and, for you. And I still have the memory. That's awesome. That's there's, a book, years. there's a book that I'm, I'm, not, I, I, uh, I'm not necessarily going to talk about today, but write it down. You want to look into this book. It's called Proof of Heaven. Proof of Heaven. 
Proof of Heaven by Dr. Eben Alexander. He's, he is a medical doctor. He is a neurosurgeon. And he had a lot of, a, a, a lot of um, patients who would have near-death experiences. And he thought that they were like, it, it was a, a chemical reaction. It was like, you know, something that the body was doing to create these images in the mind. And then he developed meningitis and got encephalitis himself. Yeah. And he was in a coma for a week. And the book is about what he saw when he was on the other side. Wow. wow. It's awesome. And it's not, a, it's not a thick book. It's a really easy read, but it will change the way you think about life and death. What's the last name again? Alexander. Yeah. I Even was Alexander. In a coma for 48 hours. Wow. And they gave me certain antibiotics because I had it from the measles. Uh huh. I developed encephalitis from measles. Wow. Because my temperature was so high. Yeah. That. Yeah. That. Wow. That's amazing. So that the antibiotics work then after 48 hours. You were okay. And then never again. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. That's, a, that's an awesome story. The thing about, you need to know about dementia is it has varying symptoms, right? The same patient can have different kinds of dementia, all right? You may be diagnosed with dementia of the Alzheimer's type, but you might have a few different kinds of dementia. The same patient can have multiple dementias. And the symptoms can change over time. Vascular dementia, it's a roller coaster because Every time you have what's called a TIA, a, tra a transient, transient ischemic attack, mini stroke, your symptoms can change. Because it's like the, 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 the circuits in your brain are shorting out and like one thing's working and another thing's not and then you have another stroke and then they reconnect and that was my, fa my father had and that was the hallmark because he would, all of a sudden his speech would get slurred and then a little while later it would clear up and he would be fine. Um, he would just have like different varying symptoms. The thing that was consistent was that he just seemed to be hallucinating all the time. Is, is, are strokes part of, I mean, are they, it's not uncommon if you have dementia, get a stroke or not necessarily? It's the other way around. If you have a stroke, if you have strokes, you get dementia. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, like, it, it, depending on what, the, See, the thing that's interesting about Alzheimer's disease, and I'm going to talk more about this book um, as we progress, this doctor says Alzheimer's, there were three different kinds of Alzheimer's disease, and they have different root causes. So it's, it's not, the, the reason that medical, that medical science is having a tough time with coming up with a cure is they're asking the wrong questions. And this is a very, this is very typical. Um, they are, they assume that Alzheimer's disease is a brain disease. But apparently what it is, is a number of different physical ailments that have different root causes that cause inflammation in the brain that become Alzheimer's disease, or what we call Alzheimer's disease. Interesting, right? Yeah, I've never heard of that. Yeah, well, <laughs> okay. Alzheimer's comes from a collection of illnesses, right, that, that cause inflammation in the body, okay? So things like type two diabetes, very often, that the syndrome that creates type 2 diabetes leads to Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. So, and oh, I'll, I'm going to get more into this, but the, the, is that and, very common? It is extremely common. If you have type 2 diabetes, uh, yeah, you want to you, you want to you want to get a get a handle on the diet, and we'll talk about ways to approach it. But yeah. Um, there's a very strong correlation between what's called insulin resistance and cognitive decline, okay? The, 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 the root causes of your body not being able to deal with processing sugar are the same ones that cause the inflammation in the brain and, and, and create cognitive decline. It is interesting. I just gave up sugar about three weeks ago in addition to losing about 
eight, nine pounds. Uh-huh. Completely? Yeah. You feeling better? Yeah, I feel better. I, I lost some weight. I'm trying to get under where I, I have a number I'm trying to get under. Awesome. But I'm wondering if I'll find myself maybe cognitively not not cured, but a little better. It, it, it happens. And well, I'll, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It does. Um, no carbohydrates, no food. Beef. I do eat apples. But right. never, but never, but you, I used candy, sugar cereal, and all that. Uh, corn syrup and all that. Oh, uh, yeah, what, really bad for you. Corn syrup is terrible for you. Um, and, oh, processed sugars, high fructose corn syrup is public enemy number one. If you can get that out of your life, you're going to be much healthier. That's that, that that's the I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Okay. So um, yeah, and I'll we'll, we'll hang in there. All right. So it's also it's horrible for the family. Okay, especially once the person who's afflicted, as Mike is unfortunately is finding out with his mother-in-law, the family has to pick up for that person because the the person who's afflicted can no longer make decisions for themselves. They are not in a position to be able to live independently and so someone has to step up and help them and that's you know that that, that makes it, that causes stress on the family it's psychological stress emotional stress and financial stress because getting sick is extremely expensive and if we want to be able to survive it then we better have some plans in place to be able to okay Absolutely. Oh, yeah, having to drag somebody around. My mother, I'll tell you a funny story. My mother um, was living with us and she fell out of bed. And she didn't call us. She, just, she fell out of bed and she sat on the floor and she kept trying to get up and she couldn't get up. So in the morning I hear a kerplop sound and I'm like, and I walk in and my mother is sitting on the floor of her bedroom, her legs splayed. She's got this huge purple hematoma on her knee. And I'm like, Mom, what happened? I fell. And it's like, why didn't you call us? I didn't want to disturb you. I'm like, Mom, the reason you're living here is <laughs> so that we can help you. And you know, my mom was not was not a petite flower. You know, she was heavy. And my husband is not a petite flower either. He's six seven, and he's he's a big strong man. So. And she's like, she's upset. She's getting really upset because she's, she's been on the floor for a while and she really needs to pee. So, and my husband tried to pick her up and couldn't. And she was afraid of hurting him. So that makes it even harder. So we have hardwood floors. So he grabs her by the arms and he's dragging her down the floor and slides her to the bathroom. She's giggling like crazy. But he, got, he helped her to get to the bathroom and helped her up on the toilet and she took care of the rest. But I called, I, I, I called 911, emergency, the emergency squad came. They were lovely, they took her down, they took her to the hospital, she got x-ray, she didn't break anything, but you know, she got a boo-boo and she got a boo-boo and she was okay. But the thing was, and what I, what I really came to understand at that point was the reason, even if I was strong enough to lift my mother or my, my husband was, my mother's fear of hurting us kind of interferes with the whole process. So I started hiring caregivers. And they are trained to know how to lift, lift people. And because they're professional, my mother was more cooperative with them. She wasn't afraid of hurting them, right? So this is something we gotta keep in mind. There's a place for professionals in our lives. And that's the other thing. So many of us who are taking care of older relatives aren't exactly young ourselves anymore, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's very important that we don't jeopardize our own future health taking care of someone who's less able, all right? So that's, I, I, I always put your own health first. Always, 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 okay? Um, and grief is ongoing. All right, so especially where the family is concerned because I know for me, all right, when, my, when, when I learned that my father had dementia, 
that was a, such a shot in the heart because my father was such a smart guy. He was a funny guy. He was very capable. So for him to be none of those things any longer and to see the pain that he was in was heartbreaking. And I lost my father a full year before I, I lost him for real. Was that physically and mentally? Yeah, well, yeah. He, he had a really tough time getting around. Um, his hips hurt him. He was, he was in a lot of pain. And just he caught was him. aware of the pain? Oh, yeah. How old? 76 when he died. So, uh, and, and that, was, that was tough. That was very, very tough. To lose my dad that way was really horrible. Was that from the dementia, the hips? Uh, congestive, congestive heart failure. Mm. Congestive heart failure. From the uh, yeah, but not. Because everything that, we are not, a, we, our illnesses are not segmented. They all work together, right? And the reason that as we get older, we're more prone to certain illnesses like cognitive decline and like urinary tract infections and why they become so disastrously taxing on our systems is because as we get older, we are, we are, we are, we are more um, vulnerable, right? Our systems are not as strong. They are more compromised than when we're younger. And so we are, things that are benign when we're young are dangerous when we're older. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. It's 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 a bitch anytime you get it, but yeah. Um, shingles is a tough one. But at any rate, so any illness that you get as you get older, like a cold, can kill some people, right? So you know, it, it, you you really you really need to be on the lookout, and it we. We have to start looking at root causes. We have to look at ways of making ourselves stronger and healthier. We're not going to live forever. It's not about length of life. It's about quality of life while you're around. All right? Now, family dynamics. Anybody here are brothers or sisters? Anybody get along 100% with any of them? Yeah, we Oh, well, good. But... It's not easy, okay? My brother and I are oil and water, okay? I love my brother, but he is a very different person than I am. And in, in our case, like when my father got sick, we worked together beautifully because my brother had a relationship with my father, as did I. My mother is a little bit of a tougher case, okay? Loved my mother dearly, dearly but she was not an easy person. And my brother had a lot of resentment for her for whatever reason. Did she have dementia as well? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's it. yeah. Oh yeah. And mom is mom. Mom is like the star of, of dementia sucks. She's the <laughs> she's she's the lady on the cover with the fan. That's that's my mother. So um, yeah. So yeah, that's her. Because <laughs> that's how she thought of herself at times. So um, yeah. So family dynamics can be very tricky. Um, also, and this is especially for adult children who are trying to have the conversation with their aging parents, you have to understand that when you start to talk to aging parents about where they're at, what, you know, that when you start having the conversations, very often the aging parents are defensive because they don't want to talk about this stuff. It's scary, right? And so they will treat you like a little kid, right? They know where the buttons are because they installed them, right? They know what things will upset you. Thank you. They know what things will upset you. So if they feel like they're losing control of the situation, then they will turn around and they will do things to upset you to grab control back. So it's not an easy thing. But it, the more aware you are of what your role is in the family, the more success you will have in being able to turn those relationships. I have a question. Yes. I don't know if you know the answer. I don't know if you know the answer. I'm always afraid that having this 
illness when I was young, whether that's going to affect my memory and uh, give me the in the future. Yeah, I don't. I, I, forgetful. Yeah, uh, but you know, I don't know to what point. Okay. Um, what I would say is, I, I would absolutely go to a neurologist and get tested, just to see where you're at. What kind of test? Cognitive tests. Oh, okay. Um, CAT scan's a good thing to get, just so he can see what your brain looks like now. Um, and we can also talk a little bit, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, um, functional medicine doctors. Functional medicine doctors are a really great resource, and and uh, and I I promise I will I will reveal what those those people are and how they work. What's that again? Functional, functional medicine doctors. Because I, I I am a firm believer that by addressing the root causes of the illnesses that we have, we can stave off cognitive decline and promote healthier life and quality of life, all right? And the, the reason I do this, and I, I put these numbers up again because I think this is so crucially important, 40 to 50% of family caregivers die before their patient. That's a huge number, all right? So when I say caregiver, take care of yourself first, I'm not kidding because it's a matter of survival. And 63% of spousal caregivers die first. It is a lot because the stress is so high. There was a piece on, on CBS News on, on uh, 60 Minutes. They showed it, they, they, they showed it twice last year. Um, they followed a couple for 10 years. The wife was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and the husband promised to take care of her and would never put her in a home. And every year for 10 years, they revisited this couple. And by year 10, he had put his wife in a home because if he didn't, he was gonna die. Because he just, he realized that the vow that he made when they got married was to a different person than the person he was taking care of. Because the per with, when you have cognitive decline, you become a different person. The person you were is still in there to an extent, but once, once, once you, you, you have these things impinging on your ability to think, it has a tendency to change you. What are the typical uh, ramifications of that in terms of your behavior and that kind of thing? Ah, well, it, it really depends on the trajectory of the disease and the type of disease, but in the case of this couple, for instance, the wife, every year she became more and more forgetful and then eventually she became nonverbal. Uh, she so could not speak anymore. So had she been diagnosed by that time? Oh, oh yeah. No, at the beginning okay. of the uh, uh, at the beginning of of, of the of the ten year period, they had um, they, 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 she had already been diagnosed, okay. so and she was already you know showing signs. You know so she ten was ten years later. Ten years later, she was she was not she, he was unable to have any kind of relationship with her any longer. She was. She was very, very, very impaired. No, no, no more language, no more connection, no more. She didn't know him. She, yeah, she was, she was unaware. Yes, socialization is, is, is extremely important. Is that just during the day, and you, she comes home at night. Yeah, yeah. She decided to pick up at nine o'clock every hour before o'clock, and then the bus is all the other kids. Um, what put my mother in the nursing home? Simply because it just got she was living with me. And she was falling too much. I couldn't pick her up. The fire department had a nice relationship with firemen. Um, <laughs> her hallucinations were ridiculous at night when we gave the day time. Sure. But we put her in, and after six months, my sister and I said to each other, I think she's getting better. <laughs> you and know what? She didn't want to go. But of course she not. Went, and there were oh, there more socialization? Is that the socialization. She was up, she was out of her room. Uh, people at least said hello to her. It she makes could ask for a cookie. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it makes it such a big difference. Oh, I oh, oh they, they were, there were there were all kinds of facilities. And you know, people people have, you have to understand that when you put someone in a facility, you don't just leave them and never go back. Oh, no. 
You got you got to do the pop in. You got to be like you got to still be involved. The last place my mother went to was called, it was a group home. Okay. Uh, now, what is a group home? A group home it's it, it's a very homey setting, and there are people with various different requirements for custodial care. No, this one was in Montclair. Yeah, this one was in Montclair, um, and and it, it I know the people who operate the place, so it, I got a, I got a great deal, and my mom was got great care there. And when I first brought her there, they said, "Don't come back for two weeks." Yeah. What? Give her, no, give her a chance to settle in. Now, I, I must mention that at this point in my relationship with my mother, I'm not her daughter anymore. I'm her big sister, Sylvia. All right. My mother has not called me Tracy in a very long time. So, um, so I was used to being Sylvia, and I was okay with it. You know, all right. She knows there's the relationship. It's just I'm way too old to be her daughter because she's only 17. In her head. <laughs> how, how is she? How does she introduce you to people? Oh, she would say she would call. This is my big sister, Sylvia. The, all the, aid, the, 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 the the caregivers and the aides that she, that in the yeah. home, they knew when she was looking for Sylvia, she was looking for me. They knew. They, and they understood. But wait, after the two weeks, I come back, and it was, it was kind of like, you know, when you first walk in, you know, it's bright outside and it's dark inside, so I couldn't see. And I stopped at the desk, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm writing my name in the register, and I hear, Tracy! And I look, and it's my mom. And she was so excited to see me, and she knew it was me. And it was like, woohoo, today I'm Tracy. That's awesome. Right? So it changes. And the, the, the care that she got there was awesome. I was very, very pleased with these people because every time I came in, I saw how they were, how they were interacting with her because they didn't know when I was coming. Right? And there was one guy in particular who, who she reminded him of his grandmother. And he used to call her mommy, and he, it just blew my mind. He was so good with her. And my mom got to a point where she was practically nonverbal every time I saw her. But at, on, at this one visit where she did not respond to me the entire time that I was there, right? She, was, she pretty much slept. And I held her, and I rocked her, and, I, you know, and then I got up. And I realized that she was, she was fidgety, and she, she I, and I said, "Ma, you got to pee." And she was like, "Yeah." And I was like, "Okay." And I got, I got somebody to take her to the restroom, and I went. And when I came back, she was in the living room, sitting in a wheelchair. And mind you, she hasn't like said anything to me the entire time I'm there. And I leaned over and I kissed her, and I said, "Ma, I'm gonna gonna head back to Ringwood. I'll I'll, I'll see you again soon." She looked me straight in the eye, and she said. Do not feel guilty for leaving me here. Wow. That's one of the best gifts I ever got. And that was the first time she had even come close to saying something like that. Well, she, she gave me clues at other points, but that was big because she'd been nonverbal pretty much. Like, and and, and she, she, she opens up a lucid window to let me know that, number one, she knew who I was. Number two, she didn't want me to feel bad. Number three, she knew that she was where she needed to be and was getting the care that she needed. So in that one, that one simple phrase, okay. that, was, that was big. Yes? Yeah, uh, you had mentioned before about symptoms at the beginning. Besides being forgetfulness, what kind of other uh, okay, um, personality changes. Um, they get, get mood shift, mood swings. Um, uh, yeah, hallucinations for sure. Yeah, yeah. They start, they will report seeing things that you can't see. Beg your pardon? Can be. They, it's, it's said that when people develop dementia, they're the same as they always were, only more so. Okay, so it like it it, it, it kind of exacerbates. No. There can be a frustration. Yeah. And yeah, and depending on the type of dementia, like there's a, a type of dementia called Louis, um, Pick's disease, 
where the, the frontal lobes shrink and the, pe and the person becomes um, inappropriate and lewd. So it, it's really, it's, it, it really depends. What's well, scary is that um, I realize now that my son was a racist. <laughs> now I mean it, I'm serious. Was she, was she a racist? I, I never knew her before. Now, she was much better at hiding it. Color. It's like, uh, happened, just last night, just happened, the doorbell rang at it. You know, it was just a moving guy over. He finished a moving job for me, a Latino guy. And he's coming to this final payment. He's going to be at a sit to the table. Like, it's at 37 o'clock. He came in, and my mother was at the table. My wife was in the shower or something. I'm talking to him, right? And the next thing I know, uh, I didn't know, my mother was slipped past me. We're a walker. And he's lying in bed, my wife was at the shower. Why are you I'm doing a bed? She said, I was afraid of that guy. You mean Chris? I mean, she know. And I said, Joe, she's afraid of the guy that didn't want to the sweetest guy in the world. I mean, yeah, it, so all that kind of but it, it might not be racist. It, it it might not be racist. It's just her lack of familiarity with him. So it, it, you might want to give her a break on that one because my I, I I took my mom down to Florida um, to, uh, to 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 visit with my sister in law and my brother in law, and they were having a fight, and my mother was terrified of. Of my brother-in-law at that point, and he didn't—he didn't like take anything out on her. It was just you know there was this bickering directed to my sister-in-law, but she was she was sensitive to what was going on, and she was she she she, she had her she had her cane by her bed, and she was I'm going to clock him on the head if he comes in here. <laughs> so um, it, yeah, so you know, it, it really a lot of it is the strange, the strangeness that she, she just doesn't recognize him because with, with dementia, like as I as I said, you know, the, the the people who are family, they know, they still know their family. They know that there's a relationship. They may might not remember the name. They might not remember exactly what the relationship is, but they tend to know that this is a this is this person is family. So, but. That gentleman was not family, and so she was afraid of him. It gets worse, though, when they really truly are racist, and they, they, they just like start letting the epithets fly, and that happens a lot. It's like a little kid who, like, you know. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. But at any rate, um, all right, so let's talk about dealing with the expense, because it's horrendously expensive, right? So um, some people choose to self-insure, all right? Now, what does that mean? That means they put aside a pile of money and say, in the event that I get sick, spend this on me. This is my, you know, don't send me to the nursing home money or send me to the nicest nursing home ever de designed money. Um, and that works for very wealthy people <laughs> because the, just so you know, the average price of a nursing home in the state of New Jersey in 2018 is $14,000 a month. A month. That's the average. That's average. Yeah. I, I, there's a lovely place in Manhattan on West End Avenue, $22,000 a month. There's a lovely place up on Tuba Way in Whitecourt. Uh huh. I don't think you can find anything much better. There, there are all kinds. There are all kinds, and the prices vary, and the services vary. But the one thing they have in common is once you start seeing what the prices are, your head will explode because it's, they're scary expensive. Medicaid, Medicare, or mm. private or no, no, no. Private pay, but. Private. Or if you have private insurance, which nobody has. Probably. Right, but something you need to know. Every home that is classified as a nursing home in the state of New Jersey must set aside 10% of their beds for Medicaid. They could. True. But, and, and this is where, you know, it, it, it pays to know somebody like me because I, 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 I can help with the savvy shopping. Okay? A lot of people don't understand that you can negotiate particularly if it's a place that has beds, all right? They are looking to fill beds, all right? And most of them require you to privately pay for a number of months 
before you can take a Medicaid bed. All right? But if you negotiate with them ahead of time, then, and it's not like they have like, this section of the nursing home is Medicaid beds. It's not like that. It's just you are you are using one of their of, of their beds, but you are paying the Medicaid rate and the and it's being paid by it's Medicaid. Like if you're in a plane, you guys actually pay a thousand, you pay five hundred. Right, right. So n knowing where to go and how to negotiate can help, and um, and it's very important. And we'll talk, talk a little bit more about this in a minute um, to plan for that eventuality because very few of us have the resources to be able to pay for a nursing home or similar facility for a very long time. But again, you want every you want every advantage in your negotiation and don't think that just because you go to a place and they tell you it's this price that it's necessarily that price. Because if they've got availability and they're springing up like mushrooms, so a lot of them have availability. Yeah. They're, they're building for the future because they know that this particularly are at my age, I don't know, some other age. But I mean the baby boom. The baby boom. Yeah. The baby boom is gonna have a lot of residents. Well since the building has gone up pretty far, they they build like they're all every yeah. time they turn on the building, it's a new building it's a system of Yes. Now you can have full time health for six months. Yes. And that's another thing to be if you're gonna Yes. Well that and that's then that's another thing to consider because you know, depending on what kind of services they have available, right, and you can add on. And they, you, a lot of them have a la carte, right? You, you have the room and then you can add on services like having your medications delivered to you. Um, yeah, my wife's father was in one of those. And he actually escaped one that day. <laughs> he literally walked up the front door and went down to the Burger King to get a hamburger. He didn't know where he was. Oh boy. This is this is why they have lockdown units I, I know. for they, people who wander. They couldn't figure out how he got out, but he got out. Yep. You said if they, if you don't have insurance, it's about at least one hundred fifty thousand a year. Oh yeah. Roughly. Huh? Oh, yeah. Easily. Easily. Yep. Easily, and that doesn't include medications. So yeah. It's it's expensive to get sick in this country, um, especially in this in this in this state. It's extremely expensive. Okay, long term care solutions, and there are more than you think. Okay, so who's heard of long term care insurance? We tried to get it. Good. Right. Okay. Who has it? Okay. Good for you. That's don't let it don't let it lapse. Tried to get it for my husband. Yeah. Okay, now, there are other ways of handling it. If you have the means, and I, it's not a bad idea to talk to a professional who can help, there are tools like life insurance that can be used for long-term care. If you're healthy enough to get it, life insurance is a good option. If you're not healthy enough to get it, but you do have some cash and you want to multiply its effects, you can get something called an annuity. Now, there are lots of different kinds of annuities, and if you listen to Susie Ormond, you will never get an annuity in your life. <laughs> she hates them. However, she's wrong, okay? For some people, the right kind of annuity can be a lifesaver. And many annuities are Medicaid compliant. In other words, once you put money into it, Medicaid looks the other way. Okay, so it's a good way to shelter the money and multiply its capabilities for you so that you can pay for at least a portion of the care that you need when you get older. How does an annuity work? That's a topic for another class. <laughs> but essentially, it's a tool that lets you put money into an account and the insurance company that underwrites it says, okay, you're giving us this much money. In this, in this many years, you'll get this much money out. In this many years, you'll get that much money out. And if you need it for long-term care, you can get this much money out. So you get guarantees, okay? So that's the lovely thing about annuities. They give you guarantees. And you can also get a death benefit on them, which is also really nice. And you so don't the have to get you don't that and long term care insurance if you have okay. a guarantee. Okay, great question. 
First of all, annuities, there's no medical. They don't care how healthy you are or unhealthy. But if you get, once you hit a certain age, they won't sell you one anymore. Okay, and you have to be 59 and a half to take money out of it without penalties. What age won't they sell you anymore? Um, depends on the company, but it's usually like high, like 80s. So, um, so you, you, need, you need to talk, I would talk to a professional, but it's, it's a good way to take your money and turn it into a lot more money to use for care. My husband doesn't like them either, annuities, he's a CPA. Yeah, CPAs don't like any financial tools. No, but the return isn't the best on them. That's no, the that's, but the thing is, with the interest rates are today, they're going to sit in the checking account or CD, annuities are financial. Well, and that's the thing. If you have to look at it as, okay, what other tools are there right. that do anything comparable? Right. Right. And most of the other tools out there do not have death benefits, and they do not have guarantees, right? They're not paying interest anyway. Right, right. So, so you are, so anything that's safe, anything that's got a guarantee, is going to cost you, but in the end, it's going to pay you more than other things out there, unless you have a genius financial advisor who knows exactly how to invest the stuff and knows how to multiply your money. And there's nobody out there like that. I'm sorry, there. You know. No, because people <laughs> like this. Correct. So, you know, and you get to a certain age and you don't have a lot of time to make your money grow, right? But annuities, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you guys anything. I'm just, it's, a, it's an informational How thing. How is it different from long-term care insurance? Okay, so long-term care insurance is like a term policy, okay? You, get, you give an insurance company a certain amount of money and if you get sick, and that's only if you get sick, then you can use the money for custodial care. And they tell you how you can use the money. So you get, a, you, you get a policy and usually there is what's called an elimination period. What that means is there's a period during which you have to pay for it yourself. You have to pay for care yourself. Does it go on forever? Depends. It depends. Like um, my, my parents had a 100 day elimination period. Like the deductible. Well, no, it's, it's a certain amount of days that you have to self pay. So a deductible is a money amount. This is a, 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 t a temporal amount, time. So, but the thing is that they realize that some people get sick for a little bit of time. And so if you can pay for, you know, you get sick and you're sick for 100 days, for a lot of people that'll be, that if, it, if it's if you need, in a skilled nursing situation, then Medicare might pick up some of it, right? But if you're in a cognitive situation where you need custodial care, somebody to help you get dressed and somebody to feed you, somebody, those kinds of things, Medicare doesn't pay for any of that. So during that time, you would have to self-pay for whatever services you require. Then, and only then, would they start paying for services of a paid caregiver, of a facility. Um, for, for different um, assistive technologies and things of that nature. So, um, so and, and you know, if, you, if you don't have an event, right, then the money that you've paid for that policy, yeah. you, you don't get back. It's like term insurance. Right, exactly, it is term insurance. So it's, 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 and it's only good as long as you pay for it, right? And there are no guarantees that your premium will always stay the same. So, you know, and most of the long-term care insur insurers did not build their models correctly. And so Genworth, who is the, the largest insurer out there, no longer sells long-term care insurance. Right? If you have a policy with them, they will service it, but you can't get a new policy. And, and, and you know, so, and what, the reason I personally prefer tools like life in, cash, cash value life insurance is if you don't get sick, you can, use the, you can use the money in the policy for something else. You can put a ramp on your house, or you can put a new roof on your house, or you can buy a new apartment, or you can buy your way into uh, an assisted living. There are a lot of things that you can do with the money that you know, that, 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 that don't require a long-term care event, and you don't have to tell, you know, you don't have to justify it to anybody. It's your money, so you can use it how you want, right? And how does the annuity work? Is it long-term? 
Okay, uh, it's, I, again, I don't wanna, I, it's, there are different kinds of annuities. The, the, the whole idea behind an annuity is that you give an insurance company a chunk of money and they turn it into more money. They, they, they pay dividends on top of that money and it grows. And it, and, and, and it, grow, it, 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 it has certain tax advantages as it's growing. So it, there, and it also, and you can get a death benefit. You can, you can ha, you, so, so if you don't use it, the money goes to your heirs. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so that's, and, and, and the, big, the big difference between life insurance and annuity is that life insurance is based on the idea that you're, you've got, you're in good health, right? Annuity doesn't matter. So you don't have to get a medical or anything like that. Yes? Can you give us some names of some big uh, annuity companies that? <laughs> oh, um, okay. Um, you know what? Let, let me let me do that when I'm not recording, because oh. um, I have certain credentials, and if I'm talking about specific products, I could get into trouble with Finra, oh. and, and so so forgive me, That's but I but I will be happy to I give understand. you I'll be happy to give you some uh, I, some ideas. Yes. Uh, so annuity will give you a set amount of money if you need it for long term care, whereas a long term life insurance they'll pay for the long term care no matter what it costs. No, that's not true. No, there are limits. Long-term long -term care insurance policies have limits. So generally, there's either there's there's a time limit and there is a uh, a benefit limit, right? And the higher the benefit, the higher the premium. The longer it's you're insured for, the higher the premium. The 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 the, uh, the shorter the elimination period, the higher the premium. So all these things, there are a lot of different levers that you can pull, and you also need to be in reasonably good health to be approved. So what's the disadvantage of the annuity? It seems to have a lot of advantages. What's it costs money. It costs money. So the, the, it, it, there's, there are fees, and you, you, know, you need to have, you, know, you, you need to be willing to put some money into it. Um, and there, again, there are different kinds of annuities. There are indexed annuities, which but are it costs more money than the life than the term than the yeah uh, yeah. Well, it depends. Again, it's it's care and care. yeah. Well, I would you know, I would go to a professional and ask, and yeah. uh, and, and 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 I know professionals who do that kind I, of stuff. I think what's happened is people who who were younger and were starting a business got life insurance if they were getting married that kind of. Right. But as they're getting older, they're converting that to long-term care because you know they have kids and they don't you know, they're maybe in college still. Right, right, right. When so you're it's one of those kind right. of things that it's really it's changing. Right. Well, you're also you know you're, you're insurance is all about mitigating risk, right? right? So when you're younger, the risk is that you know. You die early and your family is not provided for, right? So you want to mitigate the, you, you, you want to have enough insurance for your loved ones to be able to pay off the house and, you know, maybe still send the kids to college, maybe still, you know, have the wife have like, whatever, you know, have a, a on, on, a, a ongoing, right? As you get older, it's less about protecting your kids and it's more about protecting you, right? So, um, and, and as we get older, you know, when you're younger, term insurance makes sense to an extent. However, when you're younger, it's a great time to get permanent insurance because it's cheap and it's building, it's building equity over time, right? You're building an asset. When you're paying for term insurance, you're renting, right? So all that money that you're putting in is just being flushed down the toilet. And at the same time, the insurance companies are making out. They love selling term policies. Why? Because young people don't die early. Actuarially speaking, okay, it's very rare for them to pay off on a term policy for a young person. It, it's very, very rare. But you can't get it. Okay. I, I won't turn I don't anymore. But when I was younger, my wife and I both had to make big amounts. Sure. We're in good health. We pay peanuts for it. Right. Also, when it comes out of an insurance policy, it's tax-free. Yes. Yes. So, you know, when you when you start doing the calculations, you come out way ahead with life insurance. Life insurance is a very overlooked vehicle. 
Of course, the people who really want life insurance are the people who can't qualify anymore. So, all right. So, um, Medicaid planning. What's that about? Medicaid planning is knowing that the largest long-term long-term care insurer in the United States is Medicaid. Okay. And why is that? Because on a long enough timeline, we all wind up going on it. Because you run out of money. Because the 14,000 plus a month in cognitive decline can last for a very long time. So 10, 15, 20 years. How are you going to manage that, 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 that expense? That's what Medicaid does. And a lot of people, you know, I, I've talked to people all the time and they say, oh, but by doing that, you're, you're planning to, che to cheat the government. No, you're not. You've been putting, thank you. You've been, we've, we have all been, uh, those of us who work for a living have been putting money into the system all of our productive lives. And this is a type of insurance that is there so that when you are old and you need it, it's there so that you get the care that you deserve, all right, without having to bankrupt and spend every single last dime that you have. Now, you may have heard that you have to spend down to your last two thousand dollars, and technically, okay, wait, 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 okay. Now, if you're a single person in the state of New Jersey, that's true, but you can put your money in specific vehicles that will protect it for your benefit and for the benefit of your heirs. And that's not cheating. That's what's called estate planning, okay? So by working with an estate attorney who understands how Medicaid works, you can create documents that protect the money, that put it in a place where it can be accessed for your care or the care of a loved one who has created this device, okay? They're called trusts. Um, that, so that you can have that money available and Medicaid will not take it away, all right? Another thing you need to know is if you are married and one of you gets sick, there's something called community spouse. The community spouse is the person who's healthy and the, the, and, and the, 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 the patient, okay, is the one who's going to be under scrutiny for Medicaid, okay? So the person who's sick needs to be impoverished down to that $2,000 mark. However, the community spouse, the healthy person, gets to keep the house, gets to keep a car, and gets to keep a hundred and, I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but somewhere around $120,000 in cash. Is that impoverished? Not exactly, depending on what your standards are. So, by knowing this, again, you wanna work with a good estate attorney. They will help you to, bless you, plan for and anticipate that Medicaid need, okay? And don't think that you can just take your money and give it to your kids and then apply for Medicaid. It don't work that way. That's what the five year look back period is about. Medicaid is gonna say, okay, last week you had half a million dollars, where'd it go? Oh, I gave it to my kids. Yeah. All right, so you don't wanna do that. Do not sign over your house to anybody. Do not do that without talking to an attorney first, please. Okay? Reason being, it doesn't help you. And it doesn't help your kids. What if it's more than five years? Then you're okay. If, no. if it's more than five years, what? Yeah, you hand it over. Yeah. Yeah, but then you don't get the step up. Balance. Thank you. Okay. All right. It, when, okay, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. You give your house to your kids, right? And then you die. You die. Okay? They are going to have to pay capital gains on the house when they sell it as if they're you. If they inherit your house, then they get the step up from the value of the house on the day you die, or the day after you die. And so they don't have to pay capital gains when they sell the house. 
They only have to pay it on how much it appreciates after you die. So you're doing your kids a big favor by... What about if you put the house in trust? Uh-huh. How do that um, Okay. The trust then owns the house, and that can be a good thing, but I would talk to an attorney first. But you don't want to just like put it in, their, in your kid's name. That can be, that's, a, that's a, a very dodgy thing to do. But anytime you put something in a trust, you're saying, I relinquish ownership of this and it belongs to the trust. And then the control of the trust is the trustee. And you want to make sure it's someone you trust to be the trustee, right? Someone you can talk to. Um, because if you want to be able to get money out of the trust, you want to be able to call your trustee and say, okay, I want to buy whatever. Write me a check. Okay. So, all right, so Medicaid planning, state planning, very important. And if you have any assets at all, it's a really good thing to look into. Um, family collaboration, you should be so lucky. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, okay, so maybe, you know, the siblings can pony up some money to help out with mom and dad. But here's my perspective on, on, on this. Your money should be for your care. Your parents' money should be for their care. Your kids' money should be for their care. So everyone is entitled to get the care that they want or need, but nobody should have to take from somebody else to pay for their care. That's the way I like to look at it. It's not always practical, but it's something that I often talk to, especially adult children, because I have clients that they don't, want, they don't want to spend the parents' money on them because they're afraid of taking it away from their inheritance, and that irritates me no end. That's, not nice That's wrong. That's not a nice thing. No, it's wrong. It's absolutely wrong, and it's, it's, it's dangerous. People can be very, very cruel, and that we, want, we want to try and mitigate that as much as possible. Okay, so. In our, in our society, we are told that we can just take a pill for everything, right? So when it comes to cognitive decline, what tools do we have? Aricept. That's the number one medication that is offered to people in cognitive decline. It's not terribly effective. They will tell you that it stops the progress of the disease. It doesn't make you better, I can tell you. Yeah, I know. And, and, and it causes, in most people, some kind of gastric distress. Um, so, not so good. Nemenda is the last medication that was approved by the FDA for cognitive decline. And it is usually, yeah, of course. And I can, I'll, I, I, I can, I'll, I'll be providing the slide deck also. Oh, so. okay. Um, what does that mean? All right, so, so Nemenda is usually prescribed to people who are in the later stages. Also, pretty useless. Exelon patch, very expensive. It's, it's like Aricept, um, but it's delivered transdermally, so it is less likely to cause gastric symptoms. But it, again, it doesn't really help. My mother was on Exelon patch, and the one thing that she would always remember was that she needed to have her patch put on every day. I couldn't figure out how they did that. Um, Various antipsychotics, okay? Very often, the hallucinations, the acting out, that sort of thing, will be treated with antipsychotic drugs. Haldol, big bad old one. Risperdal, um, what's the other one? Seroquel, my mom was on both of those. Um, various antidepressants, very popular. Especially in the, in the cognitive decline area, the d doctors like to say things like, oh, you're just depressed. So you have pseudo-dementia because depression causes memory loss. Grief causes memory loss. So just take a pill. Those do help them. They do? Depressed antidepressants? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Hey, you know what? If it helps you, awesome. I'm glad to hear it. I don't know if it's actual or... Placebo effect? Yeah. Yeah, that can happen too. Um, in my experience, they're minimally effective and they can be dangerous for the elderly. Let me show you something. Okay. I don't know if you can see this. 
Warning, increased mortality in elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis. Elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis treated with antipsychotic drugs are at an increased risk of death. Risperdal, Risperdone, um, is not approved for the treatment of patients with dementia-related psychosis. See warnings and precautions. This is the kind of stuff that I saw when my mom was put on antipsychotics when she was violent and in the, in, in, in the, uh, in the loony bin. Still yeah, no, no, this is, this is antipsychotics. Okay, so, and what did they say to me? But this is all we have. Who said that? The psychiatrists who are treating my mother. Okay, and they, they will tell you that because it is, it's all they have. Yeah. However, there are other things that you can do. These are what are known as non-medical interventions. They're all safe. Okay? Music therapy is extremely powerful in cognitive decline. All right? People who are who were previously nonverbal, okay? will begin to speak again. They remember lyrics. They become engaged, all right? So music therapy is very powerful. Dance therapy. Dance combines social aspects as well as physical motion aspects, okay? So, and music. So all of those beautiful things in one activity. So dance is one of the most heavily advocated non-medical interventions there is. All right, so as long as the person is not in a dangerous environment where they can fall down or fall onto things, okay, dance is awesome. Aromatherapy is very powerful, okay? Uh, I know there's a woman who works with, she, she, she gives people scents like grass, you know, the smell of like fresh cut grass. Um, vanilla, baking, things of that nature. Lavender is common, okay? So aromatherapy, especially with essential oils, which have no harmful ingredients in them, are really terrific ways of helping people to connect with memory and, 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 and more positive emotion, and it's very, very common, okay? Physical therapy. Helping people to get stronger, helping them to do the right exercises that are safe for what they're able to do, okay? My mother did awesome on physical therapy, particularly when they, they would send a cute guy. She would, she would perform like, like, like a circus seal for the, for the cute guys. She was, she, she was such a flirt. Um, but yeah, and, and it was effective. I mean, she got stronger, you know? And, and she came back a bunch of times. Occupational therapy, which is different because you're engaging somebody in doing something productive like baking, like doing cookies, rolling dough, um, you know, uh, folding laundry, okay? All these kinds of things that are productive and they're great for people because one of the things that people with cognitive decline often miss out on is a feeling of purpose, yeah. right? doing something for others, being of service to others. My mother was never, wasn't like a really like super nice person. She was not somebody who volunteered or, but when she was in cognitive decline, she, she went through a phase where she, if anyone around her was like needed help, she would, she would just like jump in. If she was more able, she would jump in and help them. She just became very, very, very sweet in that regard. Social interaction, as we've, ta as we've discussed, is extremely important. And engaging in activities that reconnect people with, 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 with older memories is very helpful. Having picture albums around, having, ha having you know, things of that nature that help them to connect with early, younger versions of themselves can be very powerful. Minimizing environmental triggers. This is a big one. Um, knowing what sets somebody off makes them mad. My mother's case, it was if a group of people were standing around and talking and not including her, that's when she would go off because she was sure that they were plotting against her. 
right? The paranoia, and then she would get violent. So knowing why a person is acting the way they're acting, and sometimes it takes a little patience, and it takes a little investigation because they're seeing things that you are not. And I don't say they're things that aren't there because I don't know. <laughs> I'm not that arrogant. But it's good to just ask some questions. What's going on? What, what, what do you see? It's worth asking. And then you can figure out what's bothering them and then you can minimize what, what's, what's causing the trouble. Okay? Now, the, this is a big one, nutrition. Okay? As I've said, you want to avoid processed foods. Processed foods are responsible for a lot of the misery that we are suffering right now, I have no doubt. And this book, which was put in my hands, um, there are, this doctor has over a thousand patients who he has helped to reverse cognitive decline in. Okay, it's called, his name is Dr. Dale Bredesen, and there's a link, there's a link in the PDF. Dr. Dale Bredesen, and it's called The End of Alzheimer's. And this doctor has what's called the RECODE protocol, okay? Within the protocol, he, he it advocates for good nutrition, he advocates for meditation, yoga, okay? And he even says, when he first was started researching, his wife is, is, a holist, is a more holistic practitioner and she said to him, I guarantee you, you're gonna find that um, it, through your studies that, um, that dementia and Alzheimer's disease are directly attributable to lifestyle. And he poo-pooed her. And then he, and later on in the book he says, I wish I'd listened to her sooner. So um, I'm gonna read to you about his patient zero, okay? This doctor says, um, okay, everyone knows a cancer survivor, no one knows an Alzheimer's survivor. Meet Kristen. Kristen is suicidal. Years before, she had watched in despair as her mother's mind slipped away, forcing her to enter a nursing home after she could no longer recognize family members, let alone care for herself. Kristen had suffered along with her mother who at age 62 had begun, begun an 18 year decline into Alzheimer's disease. And at the end, Kristen had suffered alone for her mother was no longer sentient. Kristen was 65, uh, when, when Kristen was 65, she began to experience her own cognitive problems. She got lost when driving on the freeway, unable to remember where to get off and on, even on familiar routes. She no longer, could no longer analyze critical data to her job or organize and prepare reports in a timely fashion. Unable to remember numbers, she had to write down even four digits, not to mention phone numbers. She had trouble remembering what she had read, and by the time she reached the bottom of a page, had to start at the top again. Reluctantly, Kristen prepared for her resignation. She began to make mistakes more and more frequently, often calling her pets by the wrong names and having to search to find the light switches in her own home, even though she had flipped them on and off for years. Like many people, Kristen tried to ignore these symptoms, but they got worse and worse. After two years of unremitting cognitive decline, she consulted her physician who told her she was becoming demented just as her mother had, and there was nothing he could do for her. He wrote, quote, memory problems, unquote, on her chart, and because of that, she was unable to obtain long-term care insurance. She underwent retinal scanning, which revealed Alzheimer's-associated amyloid. She thought about the horror of watching her mother decline, about how she would live in, with progressive dementia and no long-term and, and no long care, about the lack of treatment. She decided to commit suicide. She called her best friend Barbara, explaining, quote, I watched what, what my mother went through as she slipped away, and there is no way I will allow this to happen to me, unquote. Barbara was horrified to hear Kristen's saga. But unlike when other friends had fallen victim to, to dementia, this time Barbara had an idea. She told Kristen about new research she had heard about and suggested that rather than ending her life, Kristen travel several thousand miles to the Buck Institute for Research on Aging just north of San Francisco. In 2012, Kristen came to see me. We talked for hours. I could offer her no guarantee, no example of any patient who had used the protocol, nothing more than diagrams, theory, and data from transgenic mice. 
In reality, Barbara had been premature in sending her to the Institute. And to make matters worse, the protocol I had developed had just been turned down for its first proposed clinical trial. The review board felt it was, quote, too complicated, unquote, and pointed out that such trials are meant to test only a single drug or intervention, not an entire program. Ah, if only those disease were that sim diseases were that simple. So all I could do was, was to go over the various parts of the protocol and recommend that she take these to her physician back home, asking him if he would work with her. She did that, and so began what has become the RECODE protocol. Three months later, Kristen called me at home on a Saturday to say she could not believe the changes in her mental abilities. She was able to work full time again, to drive without getting lost, and to remember phone numbers without difficulty. She was feel, feeling better than she had in years. When I put the phone down, what rushed into my mind were the decades of research, the countless hours at the whiteboard with lab members and colleagues, the arguments with myself about each detail of theory and treatment approach. All of this had not been in vain. It had pointed us in the right direction. Of course, Kristen was only one person, as they say, an N of one. And we needed to see similar results in thousands and ultimately in millions. I thought back to the doctor who told his patient, quote, you are just an anecdote. You are not statistically significant, unquote. To which his patient replied, quote, well, my family says that, I'm, that I am significant. Besides, I'm healthy once again, so I don't care about statistics, unquote. Indeed, every fundamental change needs to start somewhere. Every successful approach must start with patient zero, and Kristen was patient zero. Wow. And according to this book, five years later, at 73, she's, she's been on Recode for five years. She works full time, travels the world, and continues to be asymptomatic. She's been on Recode? Recode. What's Recode? It's in this book. Is that, in, is that some kind of diet? It's yeah. us, okay. Here's, here's how Recode works. Recode says you go to what's called a functional medicine doctor, okay? Functional medicine doctors are people who help to eliminate the root causes of disease, okay? So they will look at your numbers, they will look at blood tests, they will look at various different different protocols to figure out what is ailing you, what's functioning well, what's not functioning well, okay? They will also look for things like toxicity. Many of us live in houses that have mold and don't realize it, okay? Mold apparently contributes to Alzheimer's disease, a type of it. Um, you, have t you have type two diabetes. They're going to help to adjust your diet so that you, you, you are functioning better. They're going to recommend exercise or movement or dance or yoga, whatever, okay, to get you functioning better. The whole idea behind functional medicine is to make you a more functional person, okay? So it's not a diet. It's not a pill. And because it's not a diet or a pill, you haven't heard about it. Right? Because what does the mainstream media like to focus on? Diets and pills. Right? The, 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 the pharmaceuticals industry has a huge amount of money sunk into suppressing this kind of information. And because we are so conditioned to believe what they tell us, we don't want to hear it. We want to hear, okay, doc, give me a pill and make me feel better. Right? But if we know that we have some control over our lives and our situation, what does that do? It can be very empowering. Now, you may look the other way and say, you know what, Tracy, this is, this is hogwash, this is hoo-hoo, whatever you want to think it is. But I'm here to tell you that being healthier cannot hurt you. <laughs> so why not try it? All right, so I'm, I, I know we're running out of time, but I'm gonna run through really quick what these resources are and, and why they're important. 36 hour day. If you are first confronted with dementia in your life, get this book. It's the manual. This is the very first book I purchased when my dad got sick. 
and I bought copies for everybody in my family because it tells you what dementia is, what it's about, and all the unexpected things that you can expect and how to deal with them. It's an awesome, awesome resource, and it is, it is updated regularly. Who's the author? Yeah, if, if, you, uh, if we go, if I click on it, okay, so this is the 36-hour 30, the day, 6th edition, um, and the, so the, the latest version is from April 2017. So the resources in it are new, okay, or newer. And the guy who wrote it? Um, it is by Nancy L. Mace and Peter V. Rabins. But if you go to a bookstore and ask for the 36 hour day, they'll know what it is. They'll help you find it. Okay? Great, it's a really great tool. Um, okay. I got another one for you. Why Buddha never had Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> Why Buddha never had Alzheimer's disease. This doctor, this guy's an Indian doctor who grew up with yoga and meditation, and he discovered that patients of his who had cognitive decline and started doing meditation reversed their cognitive decline. Empirical proof, folks, this is not hoo hoo nonsense, okay? A lot of times people hear this kind of stuff and they think, oh yeah, right, okay? But, I'm, but there's proof, there is proof and this book, uh, it, I, I, uh, somebody I know boy, and respect recommended this to me. And this was what I was reading when I first heard about this. So I didn't get this right away. But then three more people told me I had to read this. So I put this down so I could read this. And this excited me because this guy, he's a real doctor. And he has... A load of proof, and at this point, as I say, last count, he had over a thousand people he's helped. So, um, I bought the book. I took it out of the library, but I bought the book because I think it's important, and I want I want to have this as a resource on my desk. Um, and I have, I, ha I you know, I, I I have actually contacted these people. And I have information from them on the functional doctors in the area. I want to follow up. I think it's a really smart thing to do to preserve your health and to. Um... Yes. Oh, uh, Dale Bredesen. D A L E B R E D E S E N. Which one is that? That's the end of Alzheimer's. If you want to, if you want to take a look. That's the book. All right. So um, really, uh, just it's it's excellent. And you know, he, he he explains like you know why you know why you're not hearing about that book. So um, or, or or his results. So there's my book. All right. And it's it's only eleven bucks. So, but um, so this is this is my story. This is this is what tells you why I got into this in the first place. Why I am so passionate about sharing this information and helping people to understand that taking care of themselves, taking care of their loved ones, it's not some odd foreign concept. It's actually doable. So um, so those those are the, the recommended resources. Um, and. Uh, Okay, so questions and answers. How you feeling? Better. Are you? Well, yeah, because I came to this course and I have some some things that I can do something. With. Excellent. You have a little control. control. Well, yeah, I don't right. Feel like I'm floating around out there, yeah. just hoping that uh, you'll get better. Right. Well, you know, the medical establishment is going to continue to tell us that if we exhibit signs of cognitive decline, they can't do anything for us, or they can't, there's very little they can do for us. So I want you guys to know that there's, there's hope. Um, are you hopeful? Yeah. Are you satisfied? Yeah. Was this good? Yes. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. Yeah. your approach is great. Thank you. You need to write a book about how caregivers. How what? How caregivers give this. Ah, yes, okay. Well, that'll be another class. But um, if you guys don't mind, I have, 
I have, this is my, the brochure for my company. You may be wondering, how does she make money? This class is free, right? So, um, so this, is, this is my company. It's called Grand Family Planning. I help people to figure out their way through the maze, okay? Um, I work with attorneys, care managers, um, Medicaid application specialists, people of that nature. So if you would like a brochure to take home, I welcome you to do that. I also have, this is an article that was written about me and grand family planning in the Suburban Trends. So if you'd like to take one of those, it explains why I, I, I started this business and why I do what I do. I also offer free consultations. I only ask that if you want to have a consult with me to please fill out one of these um, one of these questionnaires. Now, if you don't want to work with me, that's totally fine. I will not be offended. Um, but if you want to take one of those and look at the questions, you might find them interesting because it will give you an idea of the questions you should be asking in your life and you may want to follow up some other way. But know that once this class is done, I am still available to you guys. So visit my website. You're welcome to contact me by email. Okay. Um, that's one of my email addresses. It's, uh, it's highly functional. Um, and, um, and these are my two, my, my, my two websites. The uh, TracySLawrence.com website is about me as a, an author and speaker, and Grand Family Planning is about how I help families and coach them through these kinds of issues.